Since 1995, he's worked as an investigative reporter at WFAA-TV, spearheading investigations that have led to several awards, including three DuPont and three Peabody Awards. So please give a round of applause for Brett Ship. <laughs> uh, perfect, good. Uh, everything is not perfect in my world right now. I'm a reporter with WFAA-TV, and I've been in West Texas all day. West, comma, Texas is what they call it. And as many of you probably know, there was a uh, catastrophe there last Wednesday night. Um, actually, I was speaking at another university when that happened. Um, and I was in North Texas, University of North Texas, when word came down and I was in the middle. I couldn't go there right away. Um, but obviously, I think if you're aware of what's going on in the news, you know what a tragic, calamitous situation it is uh, and how horrific uh, the conditions are. In fact, I was there all day today and I didn't even get close enough to, to see the site, but I'm investigating what I'm investigating, and my story tonight at 10 o'clock is, and that's why, thank you very graciously for being um, uh, uh, flexible with me because I gotta get back to the station to cover this story, and I've been investigating all day what the firefighters knew and when did they know it. And it sounds pretty fundamental, uh, but, um, and it might oversimplify a little bit the, the tragedy, but it is absolutely germane to what needs to be understood about the situation. And um, my mood is pretty down right now just because of what I saw today and the people and the, there were two memorial services today for firefighters. Um, and so quite obviously the whole town is on edge. Um, and then you combine that with what happened last Monday at the Boston Marathon. And, and last night I just, I, I kind of redid what I was going to do based on what I've been going through and the stories I've been covering, and, and I wrote my thoughts down, so I'm not very polished about this. But I do want to just read to you what I've, what I've put together, <clears throat> if that's okay. Say yes. <laughs> Thank you. I knew, I knew I liked y'all. When the bombs went off at the finish line in Boston one week ago today, my mind raced, my heart sank, and I thought, <clears throat> not again. It immediately took me back to 9-11-01. I'll never forget where I was and how I felt. And I'm sure most of you feel the same way. One plane, one tower, that was an accident. Second plane, second tower, 10 minutes later, that's a terrorist attack. Everyone knew it. Last week, one explosion, maybe an accident, second explosion, no accident. This was another terrorist attack. The big question after something like this is how will we as a nation respond? 9-11 was new. Not since Pearl Harbor had we been attacked on our own soil. I'll never forget driving to, Oakland, to um, New York City, the second, the second that the second South Tower, I'm sorry, the North Tower went down. That was it. We knew we were gone. We loaded up a van, my photographer, my producer, and I, and we drove all night. Outwardly, I was gung-ho, rushing to cover what would undoubtedly be the biggest story of my career. Inside, however, I was terrified. What awaited me at the end of my journey in New York City? Another bomb, another attack, a chemical attack. Was New York under siege? Could I die? Internally, these are the questions I was asking, and I was afraid. It was a sick feeling arriving in New York on the banks of the Hudson River, actually on the Jersey side, looking across the river at the smoldering void where I knew the Twin Towers once stood, staring silently, almost gasping in horror with hundreds, if not thousands of strangers lined up together, all of us mesmerized by the emptiness of the lower Manhattan skyline. We all felt the same sense of loss that day, the same kick in the gut. A couple of days later, when I was finally able to find my way close to ground zero, as I passed a growing number of crushed cars and debris and the visceral sense of sickening, sickening defeat, I began to witness something amazing, something inspiring. 
something redeeming, something beautiful, I actually began to witness what I'll call good, an uplifting collective, a spirit of cooperation, even a brotherhood. Amid the devastation and the smoldering ruins, I saw an army of volunteers, many of them being turned away and being upset about it. I lined up, they were lined up rather, to get down into ground zero, into the choking haze, to try to recover and hopefully save. I remember that smoke being so acrid, so overwhelming. A paramedic saw me. He saw me coughing, and he came up to help me breathe. And that's when it really started to hit me, that I was witnessing, and what I was witnessing was something that was happening not just in New York City, but all across the country. People helping people, strangers helping strangers. We had just been attacked. Thousands of innocent fellow Americans killed in cold blood, and their blood callously poured all over our pride. Monday morning the following week, six days after the attack, when Lower Manhattan was opening again to business and workers and commerce, my photographer and I wanted to be among those who dared to take the subway back down to the financial district just blocks from where the attack occurred. Like soldiers, back to the front lines, back into the unknown. I vividly remember that subway car being packed with workers, shoulder to shoulder, dressed in their business best, ready to race back to some sense of normalcy. But for those we talked to, their world would never be the same after seeing what they saw six days earlier. One young man I talked to, he was still in his 20s, perhaps late 20s, sharing with me about the nightmares he had had every night for the past six nights of looking out his office window as the Twin Towers burned and seeing human beings, terrified people, jumping out of windows to their death rather than burning alive in an inferno. It was difficult for him to describe. He seemed numb and in shock as he relived the horror. He and others on the train that day told me the same thing, that the terrorists were not going to win. Everyone on that train was headed back to work in one of the tall buildings that, for all they knew, could be the target of another attack. And just then, something happened. About halfway to our final stop, the lights on the subway car flickered and then went totally, totally out. The train, slowly, in the dark, rolled to a stop. No one said a word, no one screamed or, screamed or even whimpered. In fact, the car was so silent, I swear to you, you could hear the pounding of your own heartbeat because while no one spoke, everything, everyone was terrified and no doubt thinking the same thing as I was, we're all about to die. This is another attack. And in the minutes and in the complete dark, we quietly awaited for it to happen. And what seemed like a few minutes was probably only a few seconds when the lights flickered back on and the subway train began to roll forward again. Wow, a, cl a collective sigh went up as well as, yes, a few laughs. Everyone went to work that day and New York began to heal and the medicine we all took was free. It was the triumph of the human spirit and the spirit of cooperation, of unity and love. Yes, in New York City. I've said it before and I'll say it again, what I witnessed and felt those 10 days in New York City after the attack was the closest thing to heaven I will ever see on earth. Candlelight, vigils everywhere, people helping people, people holding people and hugging people. A spontaneous bond, a show of humanity that I will never forget. This past week, I saw it again. While I didn't go to Boston to cover the explosion aftermath, I felt that same collective sense of disgust and anger and that same determination that I felt and everyone else felt after 9-11. First, the pictures and the video of people helping the wounded, the care and compassion that pours from our souls when an innocent person is attacked. Then the sounds and images of the the entire arena of the Boston hockey fans belting out the Star Spangled Banner at the top of their lungs. When does that ever happen? Then again, last Friday night, 
just Friday night, that the cheers went up across the city and across the land when the second suspect was captured. Remember that. Then again, we were attacked and beaten, but we were not defeated. I've covered news for 30 years, and I see it all the time. Underdogs refusing to quit. The sick, the abused, the poor, and the forgotten who refuse, refuse to give up and stay the fight. And despite the odds and the ordeal, making the most of what they still have to never say die. Hurricane Rita, 2005. One month after Hurricane Katrina, a group of New Orleans evacuees have been relocated to Houston, only to be moved again as an even more powerful hurricane zeroed in on the Texas coast. A group of about 50 refugees were evacuated again from Houston up the coastline to Beaumont to a sturdy hotel where they would be safe. Then Hurricane Rita turned north, packing winds of 150 miles an hour, tracking right for the Hotel Elegante where I had been assigned to stay and cover the, sto the storm. As it turned out, that hotel was the bullseye. About three in the morning, the eye wall of the hurricane hit the hotel with a fury. 150 mile per hour winds shattered the front windows with such a fury that the glass was ground up like sand, and I remember it hitting me in the face. It was a furious storm, the worst I ever, ever hoped to see. And once up at the front of the hotel to capture video and witness the storm, we had to retreat back to the back of the structure where winds were shielding the rest of the people and where we felt somewhat safe. It was also in the section of the hotel, back there in the back, where the Katrina refugees had set up camp and were having what could best be described as a hurricane party. While the power was out, the refugees were somehow stocked with a bounty of provisions, including candles and flashlights and a treasure trove of really nice liquor and beer. <laughs> While the rest of the hotel guests were wondering whether they would live, the Katrina refugees were living like there was no tomorrow. But tomorrow came, and so did the revelations of the storm damage. And while I was surveying the devastation, I heard cussing and a commotion coming from the hotel lounge. The manager said, man, we got hit hard, so hard, all of my liquor bottles didn't even break. In fact, they mysteriously vanished. <laughs> and then it hit me. Then it hit me. So that's what fueled the refugee party at 3 AM in the middle of a storm. That's it. Genius. The human spirit trumps and triumphs again, and it wasn't done yet. It returned even more triumphantly. Two days later, with everyone tired, no electricity, and no water, and no sewer, and especially no food, there was a buzz of activity in the hotel parking lot, and an incredible smell, and an aroma of something gourmet cooking. A sea of people. News media, hotel workers, hotel guests, even the police were lined up to be served a hot meal, a side of beef was smoldering over a homemade grill in the parking lot. A fire pit and a vat of gumbo was on the boil. You guessed it, those same refugees had not only raided the hotel bar and saved the liquor before the storm claimed it, they had also invaded the kitchen and nabbed all of the perishables before they spoiled and they were serving them up like a four-star buffet. And guess what? Not a soul. Not even that bar manager dared to complain. We were eating a hot meal for free, courtesy of those resourceful evacuees. The poor, the disadvantaged, the twice displaced were the heroes of the day because they made the best of what they had and refused to accept defeat. Yesterday in West Texas, the survivors of the devastating fertilizer plant explosion last Wednesday gathered to not only pray for those who lost their lives, but the badly injured but they thank the Lord for the volunteers and the wave of humanity that has washed over that little town as it seeks to make sense of the tragedy that suddenly turned their world upside down. And those people will be embraced by their neighbors and they will rebuild and they will become stronger and they will do it together. And they will someday be quick to remember and rush to help their neighbors in need when hardship befalls them. And finally, at my desk at work, I keep a reminder. <sighs> at the time when someone helped me.
that day at ground zero when I found it hard to breathe? Remember the paramedic I told you about? Took off his mask and he gave it to me.